Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to uh, Global Freedom of Expression Day 2. So we're going to move right on to Asia. I've got uh, four, no, I've got five very distinguished speakers uh, surrounding me who've all traveled from a long way to, to update you and to give you some analytical overview of what's been going on in a, a range of litigation and freedom of expression related issues in different parts of Asia. And we have a, a rather packed program here. I'm trying to keep everybody to not much more than about 10 minutes so that we will have time for questions and discussion after this. So uh, without further ado, we can proceed to Southeast Asia and Dipendra. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, first, uh, thank you, Dr. Agnes and uh, President Bollinger. He's not here this morning for the invite. Uh, I'm mindful that I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to get right into, into things. Um, when, I, when I spoke to some of you last year in 2015, I um, talked about the, a concept called the three R's uh, in Malaysia, um, that being race, religion, and royalty. Um, and so long as people stay clear of these three important uh, R's, it's not the three R's that deal with recycle, reuse, and, um, and, and, and something else. It's race, religion, and royalty. You should be fine in Malaysia. But unfortunately, like all things in, in life, it doesn't quite work in the way that uh, we want it. Uh, race, religion, and royalty are pretty much the mainstays of uh, expression issues in, in, in Malaysia. And unfortunately, it has brought about quite a bit of uh, a crackdown. Uh, in the last year, if I can add one, un, um, one, uh, one issue that, 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 that underpins these three R's, that would be corruption. Now, um, Malaysians are very active on Facebook, on Twitter, and on other forms of social media. Um, yesterday, when Jacob spoke about a tweet from the Greater Glasgow Police about uh, the whole concept of think, uh, how people should think before posting something up. It reminded me of what um, the Human Rights Watch Asia Deputy Director Phil Robertson, when he, when, he, when he talked about the Malaysian Inspector General of Police, who's extremely active on Twitter as well. And he patrols Twitter like a shark in open water. <laughs> so it's very common to find him going through people's accounts and saying, look, uh, police, investigate this guy for his tweet. So a lot of people have had, whether they're politicians, whether they're activists, the moment you comment on a particular issue, usually race, religion, and royalty um, matters, you would find a retweet by the Malaysian Inspector of General who's, who tell his comrades, look, please investigate this guy for sedition. Please investigate this guy for sedition. Please investigate that guy for sedition. So um, either he has an incredibly huge budget to do these things, or he really has got no job whatsoever. Now, uh, to describe Malaysia in, uh, uh, um, in, in, a, uh, in a nutshell, 2015 and going into 2016, uh, it would be suffocating, indifferent, and, um, and a climate of fear. It really is about keeping one man and his political party who have been in charge of the country since independence 1957 in power. Some of you may have read prior to the Panama Papers, uh, quite a number of foreign media has carried stories about the Malaysian Prime Minister and how they found uh, about $681 million in his personal bank account. And he has admitted, yes, I received that money, but let me explain, it's a donation from the late Saudi king for my services to the promotion of Islam in Malaysia. And he then said that, well, because he gave me $681 million, US dollars, uh, I've written 603 because you all made so much noise. So he's kept uh, $78 million. <laughs> And <laughs> for whatever reason, and he's also admitted that some of the funds were used to bankroll the 2013 general elections. Now, um, following that, a lot of media, whether foreign or local media, have explained how that $681 million came about. It had nothing to do with the late Saudi king, but it was part of an elaborate scheme where he created this company, collateralized lands, borrowed huge sums of money, and enriched a number of people. Even Goldman Sachs, who were, um, who were the uh, finances, who, who were the company in charge of obtaining the loans, uh, received something like 90 million US dollars in, in, in commission fees. So it's, it's quite elaborate uh, in that respect. Now, before I go into some of the cases, uh, let's talk about some good news. 
it's not all that bad in Malaysia. We had a couple of brave judges who, uh, <coughs> who, who, who tried to do the right thing. One of them is unfortunately retiring pretty soon. Um, I, I prepared some notes. I, I, I don't know whether you have them. Uh, there were two decisions that, that come to mind. Number one is the decision of Sepakat Effective against the Home Minister. Um, basically, the Court of Appeal uh, had to deal with an issue where the Home Minister banned a publication. It was essentially cartoons uh, produced by, by, by a publisher that talked about political satires and, 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 and parodies. Um, the, the Court of Appeal basically said that public odium cannot be so conveniently equated with public order, let alone sedition. So the Court of Appeal was, uh, was of the view that, look, even though you make fun of politicians, it cannot be a breach of public order. Grin and bear and move on in life. So uh, that was one good decision. The second good decision was um, the Home Minister banned a financial daily, a rather influential financial daily called the, uh, the Edge. So the Edge took the Home Ministry to court because they had suspended their publishing permits. Malaysia is one of the few countries where if you want to publish, uh, media companies who want to publish anything, they need to get a permit. It doesn't apply to online um, um, journals or, or online news portals, but if you want to print it, you need to get a, a, a permit under the Printing Presses and Publications Act. Now, they banned the, the Edge, the Edge Financial Daily, uh, for about three months, saying because they carried very negative reports of the Prime Minister's brainchild, the One Malaysia Development Corporation, where the entire um, um, scheme of raising a lot of money for whatever nefarious purposes uh, was, was very well covered and extensively reported. Now, Following that, the Prime Minister, of course, said that, yes, I got all that money and, you know, it was from the late Saudi king. That's a perfectly good explanation to that. Let's not question the late Saudi king. He's dead now, so dead men carry no tails. But uh, the edge took the Home Minister to court and the, the, um, the High Court ruled that the Home Minister had acted in an irrational manner, which is pretty much what they do, and illegally issued a suspension order because there was no reason to do so. Now, the um, Attorney General's Chambers, who was acting for the Home Minister, has filed an appeal, uh, but that appeal has not come uh, for, for hearing. This, and a, another piece of good news, ah, but, but before I move to the next set of cases, it's, one has to bear in mind that those cases dealt with the Printing Process and Publications Act. They didn't deal with the Sedition Act. Sedition Act is a far more sinister uh, piece of legislation left um, uh, it's, it's been in our books since independence and unfortunately has been used on, on, on many occasions. I think at the moment there are some 38 cases involving politicians, activists, uh, academicians, students who are facing charges under the Sedition Act. Now, uh, quite a renowned professor by the name of Asmi Sharum um, was charged under the Sedition Act because he alleged that the royalty and the government um, at that time colluded to deprive the opposition of ruling a particular state. Um, he didn't say anything that was outrightly seditious. He just said that you don't want a repeat of that where a secret meeting took place. I think what happened in Pera was legally wrong. The best thing to do is to do it as legally and as transparently as possible. Seemingly innocuous um, statement that he made because he's a constitutional law professor. Now, he was then charged for promoting ill will and hatred among you know, people in the community under the Sedition Act. Now, he <coughs> challenged the Sedition Act uh, on the basis that it's not constitutional. A bit of background, the Sedition Act was passed in 1948, some nine years before independence. Now, the day Malaysia achieved independence, um, uh, there, there is a catch-all provision in the Constitution which says that any legislation that was passed before uh, may not automatically be enforceable after 1957. So given that the Sedition Act was passed in 1948, he challenged it on that basis. Now, while the Attorney General's Chambers then um, decided to stop prosecution and, and uh, acquitted and discharged him, the federal court said that the Sedition Act is valid and enforceable. So quite a number of sedition charges which were put on hold pending this decision, now, um, unfortunately, it, it, it means that the charge can go through because the federal court, the highest court in Malaysia, has ruled that um, the Sedition Act is valid, is enforceable, and can be used um, against uh, anyone who offends that. 
Now, to, to compound matters, the uh, Malaysian government has said that, well, we find the Sedition Act to be inadequate, and in 2015, they passed amendments to the Sedition Act, and I'll tell you what those amendments are in a nutshell. Sorry. Basically, the amendments involve making it far more difficult um, um, far more penal under the Sedition Act. Essentially, they have defined or they have widened the ambit of what is a seditious tendency. They've increased the impri imprisonment from a term not exceeding three years to an imprisonment for a term not less than three years, but not exceeding seven years. There's a restriction of movement where your passport will have to be surrendered and you cannot travel abroad. Um, and essentially, uh, removal of court powers to grant probationary orders to grant special orders in relation to youthful offenders. And this is because quite a number of young student leaders have voiced out how unhappy they are with uh, the current government. And introducing a special section which gives the country's communications and multimedia commission power to prevent access to publication by electronic means. In essence, blocking websites, blocking um, uh, access to, 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 to online publications. Now, there, there are quite a number of cases which are pending in the court right now. Um, some of them are quite popular or, or in involving um, well-known individuals like Zuna, a cartoonist. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, he has the unfortunate... Um, 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 uh, he's an unfortunate position because he's got nine counts of sedition charges pending. Uh, I don't think that you know, he would be convicted on, on all nine, uh, but there is a risk that if he's convicted on all nine and if, he and if his sentence runs consecutively, he faces 43 years in jail. If it runs concurrently, then he might face a maximum of seven years in jail. But either way, it's not uh, a healthy situation um, because all he did was to draw cartoons about political leaders. And if they can't appreciate humor, then there's something very much wrong, uh, to quote Jacob, in the state of Denmark, uh, in the state of Malaysia. <laughs> now, um, quite a number of people, as I mentioned, are, are, are facing sedition charges. Uh, some of the cases are pending. A lot of those cases were pending until the Federal Court decided whether the Sedition <coughs> Act is valid and enforceable. Now that the Federal Court has ruled that the Sedition Act is valid and enforceable, these cases can, can, can continue. Now, um, from a legislative aspect, I, I, I mentioned that the Sedition Act was amended um, to, to widen the ambit of sedition. Um, all of this is designed to make sure that no one talks about race, religion, royalty. Um, some people have questioned the need for royalty. Some people talk about why one race is preferred over the others. And of course, religious issues in Malaysia, um, thanks to years of um, Saudi largesse, uh, has seen a different sort of trend emerging, a trend that is a little bit worrying uh, simply because the religious department tends to have a much larger say in the ordinary lives or the day-to-day -day affairs of, of, of every Malaysian, whether where you eat, how you eat, who you interact with. <coughs> um, last year I talked about a case where non-Muslims are not allowed to use the word Allah in, 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 in Malaysia because it's offensive. Uh, there's a whole host of words which a non-Muslim cannot use, like you can't use the word Rasulullah or, or, or Bismillah or even, even Haji uh, without finding yourself in, 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 in trouble. So the Sedition Act was, um, has been amended to take into account the additional pressure that's going to be created on the, uh, on the current government. Uh, the other piece of legislation that is in the pipeline is amendments to the M Multimedia and Communications Act, basically to give them more powers to block Websites. They have blocked many websites. Um, uh, they started with the Malaysian Insider, quite, an, quite a popular online news portal that carried very unfavorable stories to the ruling government. In fact, uh, the Malaysian Insider is owned by the Edge, or the same group that owns the Edge. Um, and, I, and although they did not say it officially, but I believe a lot of pressure was applied on the Edge to close the Malaysian Insider. The official reason that was given is the Malaysian Insider is bleeding money. It's costed them something like 10 million to keep the website uh, up and running. 
but because they don't have the funds anymore, they have to take the painful decision of closing it down and thereby reducing one very significant voice as far as uh, Malaysians is concerned. Um, the minister in charge of communications and multimedia uh, basically said that um, blocking the Malaysian insider was as necessary as blocking porn sites to safeguard the well-being of the nation. That was his official quote as to why the Malaysian insider was blocked. Now, um, some of you may have also um, uh, seen quite recently there were two journalists from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, they were arrested and detained for a day for questioning the Prime Minister as he entered a mosque. Um, the police claimed that they had crossed the security line and aggressively tried to approach uh, the Prime Minister. The video speaks volumes. All they did was to ask the Prime Minister, why did you have hundreds of millions of dollars in your account? So the Prime Minister didn't say anything, but the police and, and, and uh, the authorities then took it very harshly. They didn't take it, ve they didn't take it very kindly that uh, uh, foreign journalists were in Malaysia asking these questions. They first explored the angle of uh, trying to see whether they breached their work permit, only to realize that journalists don't need <laughs> work permits to, to, to um, come into Malaysia and ask questions. Um, after much ado, they released them and said, please don't come back to Malaysia again. We don't want you here. You asked too many painful questions. So in a nutshell, Malaysia is, things are a little bit uh, difficult in Malaysia. I use the word suffocating because if you are a media activist, if you're a journalist, you have to be extremely mindful uh, as to what you report. If you report on matters relating to race royalty, which has got extremely wide, um, wide um, definitions, you have to be extremely worried about whether your reports can be construed as seditious. It's not so much about you being charged, but the hassle that you have to go through of being charged. And they will drag your case for years using this as an excuse to deprive you of either to travel or deprive you of, 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 of uh, uh, other considerations. And at worst, they will, you could be convicted and you could, be, uh, and you could spend some time in jail. I use the word indifferent because um, a lot of Malaysians now take a very indifferent attitude. They're simply fed up. They feel powerless to do anything about uh, the excesses of the current government. Uh, the Prime Minister has removed the Attorney General because the rumour had it that he wanted to charge the Prime Minister for corruption. He has put in a new Attorney General who promptly came, who, who held a press conference two weeks later with very colourful charts showing why the Prime Minister is not responsible for any acts of corruption. Now, the better thing for any Attorney General to do is to say, look, I'm going to charge him and let the courts decide. But the Attorney General then played the role of judge, jury, and even experience and said, look, look at my colorful charts. He's not guilty. You have to take it from me. You know, he's not guilty. He's not corrupted. And let's all move on. And of course, there's a climate of fear. Um, I wish I had positive, a lot of positive news uh, to tell you. But unfortunately, so long as the Sedition Act is well and alive <coughs> in Malaysia, things are not going to improve. Uh, uh, going to improve. Uh, it's used at various levels to pressure, to, 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 um, you know, um, to disappoint, to make life difficult for anyone who's interested in um, the freedom of expression in, in Malaysia. I'm hopeful that maybe with a change of government, things might improve. I, 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 I don't know. I sometimes think the opposition are also six and one half dozen of the other. Uh, they themselves don't have a clear plan. Um, so much will remain. Uh, uncertain until the next election in 2018. Uh, that's in a nutshell Malaysia. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to quickly, oh, I've run out of time. Oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't look this side. Very quickly, Singapore. Um, uh, do I have a minute to talk about Singapore? Just a minute, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so. <laughs> Sing Singapore uh, pretty much suffers the same fate of Mal in, as, as Malaysia, except there were two prominent cases. Number one, um, one relating to, and in fact, they were both relating to the Lee family and Lee Kuan Yew. One was uh, this young boy by the name of Amos Yi. Um, Lee Kuan Yew passed away last year, and um, he didn't take it <laughs> Uh, he didn't take it very nicely. He created a blog that showed that he called his blog Lee Kuan Yew butt-fucking Margaret Thatcher. 
for some reason. And uh, um, a, a lot of groups took it very, um, uh, very painfully, and he was charged. He was a young boy, <laughs> and he was sentenced to four weeks in jail. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about Amos Yee, and, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, the better thing to have done is was to actually leave him be, let him be. You know, he's just trying to express what he felt uh, uh, about Singapore. And the second case would be Roy Ng, who made comments about the uh, Singapore Prime Minister, and um, the court, surprise, surprise, found him to be guilty of defamation and ordered him to pay, I think, uh, 50,000 uh, Singapore dollars, <coughs> which he has now worked out an instalment plan with the Singapore Prime Minister that he's going to yes. pay on a monthly basis for the rest of his life. Yes. That's, in a nutshell, <laughs> Singapore. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I exceeded my time. Um, God bless Thanks very much, Dipendra. I know you've got some very detailed notes that you have submitted. I'm not sure if they're on the website yet or will be soon, but there's a very detailed report about uh, Malaysian and all the cases and the Singapore cases. Okay, we will move now to Hong Kong and over to Doreen. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, can you hear me? Is this on? It is. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, it is. All right. So good morning, everyone. I, I do want to also echo uh, Karuna's comments about how uh, wonderful this network of lawyers are. I've been involved in trying to work with forging ties with a um, variety of network of lawyers uh, in Asia, uh, globally, and so on for at least 10 years. Um, uh, finding it uh, in Hong Kong or in London and obviously here in New York. I'm very much uh, have been enjoying some of the sessions we had earlier. I'm looking forward to uh, Dario's um, uh, presentation later about their success in access to court documents, which we hope to start doing more strategic litigation in Hong Kong. Um, but for now, uh, what I would like to do is kind of introduce you to some of the issues that we uh, face in Hong Kong. Uh, so we've been asked to talk about some of the most important court decisions uh, in freedom of expression in 2015, trends that are emerging or about to um, uh, or have been taking place, and what to watch out for 2016. So obviously, I'm here to talk about Hong Kong, but by the nature of its relationship uh, with the mothership, uh, uh, mainland China, under the one country, two systems formula, uh, to which it was returned to Chinese sovereignty in 1997, my comments will obviously address some of the legal and extra legal uh, issues emanating uh, from the PRC that uh, are likely to have impact uh, in Hong Kong and legal developments there. Okay. So uh, most of you, I'm sure, remember that the one country, two system formula means that the PRC and Hong Kong are supposed to operate under two completely different political, economic, and most important legal systems. Um, and Hong Kong, as a former British colony, um, has the common law system in which um, uh, it no longer um, has to, it can follow precedents in the UK but and elsewhere in the common law world, but is no longer required to um, from uh, UK law. So last year, um, when I was here, I spent most of my presentation talking about something that had just happened uh, in Hong Kong, which was the Occupy Central um, uh, movement, the Umbrella movement, uh, in which hundreds of thousands of um, protesters uh, occupied uh, central Hong Kong for 81 consecutive days. Um, and consumed much of Hong Kong and uh, drew worldwide attention. At that time, we didn't know a lot about what was happening with those cases, so I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit um, and give you some update um, um, on that. But first, what I'd like to do um, before I go, because that, what happens with Occupy Central relates to some of the political um, uh, fallout um, I want to address. Um, but before I do that, I want to do something a bit more um, mundane, and that is talk about more traditional media law developments. Uh, we tend to, in Hong Kong, think so much in terms of China, but the truth is um, uh, it is very important to look at and, and, and feel the effects of more uh, traditional media law developments, uh, particularly in defamation and uh, privacy. Um, as we know, uh, the UK completely revamped its uh, defamation regime with the Defamation Act uh, that went into effect in 2014. Um, this was not relevant to Hong Kong. 
um, because UK legislation is no longer applied uh, to its former colony. So Hong Kong continues to look for common law um, precedents from a variety of jurisdictions. And of course, we'll look to the older jurisprudence uh, from the UK, but certainly nothing that comes out of um, the Defamation Act of, uh, of 2013. Um, so, um, but we have uh, some happy news um, in that uh, in the past year, uh, there have been two key cases um, that um, looked at the Reynolds defense um, also known as responsible journalism, public interest defense, and those were favorably applied. Um, and these are significant um, developments in Hong Kong because defamation law remains one of the biggest uh, challenges in the day-to-day -day operation of the news media. Um, and defending these cases uh, with, when there's no clarity um, uh, is quite expensive. So when we can have clarity, particularly with cases that they move up to the appellate um, levels, um, is very much welcomed. It can cost upwards of 10 million Hong Kong dollars to bring a case up to the Court of Final Appeal, which is over a million US dollars. So naturally, a lot of media companies are quite reluctant uh, to um, pursue these cases. Um, so uh, quickly, uh, in February of last year, in the case of Jigme v. Brightech, a special form of the Reynolds defense, a neutral reportage, was recognized for the first time. Um, and so uh, that was uh, very much uh, welcomed. Uh, that was um, uh, following the 2012 UK uh, decision of Flood v. Times newspapers that drew a distinction between the standard of verification uh, required in cases of reportage where the publication repeats the allegations uh, made by others, uh, provided that the publication does proper steps to verify, but also it does not adopt those allegations as its own. Um, the detail, I'm not going to go into the details of the facts in the Hong Kong case. They're quite convoluted. So for the sake of brevity, uh, Duncan will appreciate, I will not uh, elaborate on that. But suffice it to say, what was significant about this, um, not only just adopting this new uh, form of Reynolds defense, but that it also, the court acknowledged uh, for the first time that human rights consideration on which the defense was introduced in the UK was applicable to Hong Kong because they had similar underlying human rights foundations for the Hong Kong Basic Law and the Bill of Rights Ordinance. So that was an interesting uh, development. Fast forward to November, uh, the normal Reynolds defense was put on more solid footing by the Court of Appeal in a case called uh, Pui Quan K versus Ming Pao, one of the leading uh, Chinese uh, publications. And this was a case that caused a lot of concern because it was about an editorial um, about possible football match fixing. And the Court of Appeal held that the trial court had applied too strict a standard uh, for responsible journalism when the lower court required that editorials needed to refer to facts reported in rival publications in order to be considered responsible journalism. Anybody who knows Hong Kong media scene, it is an intensely um, uh, competitive environment, and that just struck to the hearts of um, most Hong Kong publications. So um, when we met with uh, the Ming Pao um, editors and strongly urged them to appeal, uh, and we're quite grateful uh, when they did and got this favorable ruling. And this is on top of a decision a couple years earlier in 2011 when the Court of Appeal applied the privilege uh, to a press release in an employment dispute involving airline pilots and Cafe Pacific um, in which they referred to the public, uh, responsible public dissemination uh, defense. Uh, so, and then unfortunately, unlike most of the Reynolds cases that happened in Hong Kong, with the exception of the Ming Pao case, um, they affirm that this defense applies, but then it fails because of the applicable facts. Um, but um, in this case, uh, they did uh, confirm that the Reynolds defense is not constricted to publications by the news media, which was uh, very much welcome indeed, uh, particularly with increasing um, uh, number of bloggers and other alternative media um, now in Hong Kong. Um, moving along to Hong Kong's own version of the right to be forgotten, I am sorry my colleague who wants me to call it the right to delink or de-index, but this is just sexier, okay? So um, the right to be forgotten is, what's that? 
No, it's okay. Um, so the right to be forgotten is emerging uh, on two tracks. I mean, they don't call it that, but it certainly is in effect. Uh, one uh, is on the defamation track, which I talked a little bit about last year. The case is still ongoing, uh, involving a local businessman's challenge against Google for the results of auto search suggestions that referred to stories that he was involved in triads years earlier. Um, he had never been prosecuted uh, for uh, any criminal involvement. Uh, with triads, and so therefore he wanted um, any of that uh, to be removed. Um, that is set for trial, um, which hasn't happened yet. But meanwhile, there is a second defamation case that was filed against Google by a media company uh, this past October that challenged the auto cert function, showing that if you Google white powder newspaper, that its name comes up. And, um, and what that refers to is that this media company's co-founder many decades ago uh, had been accused of being involved in the opium uh, trade and uh, f uh, fled to Taiwan after posting bail when he was charged and never to return and, and recently died. So uh, they are challenging that. The second track for right to be forgotten um, is, is more straightforward, and that involves the personal data law. And uh, the privacy commissioner in two cases um, has uh, rejected the creation and use of databases uh, to access public registry and court records that are in the public domain. In other words, they took these public records, um, uh, um, uh, put them together in a massive database with thousands of records, and you can imagine in the first one, it involved a smartphone app um, and instantly got a lot of thousands of subscribers who were very much interested in being able to have a use of this database. The Privacy Commissioner acted on it quite um, rapidly after getting a number number of complaints from people whose names now popped up um, on these searches and um, said that uh, this exceeded the original purpose of the data collection, which was to facilitate open justice uh, when uh, uh, court decisions are made public and it was not um, envisioned that it would produce uh, this kind of database. Um, they issued an enforcement action against the um, uh, uh, app and they quickly uh, withdrew. Uh, so that didn't uh, go any further. Um, in the second case, um, in which we got a ruling just fairly recently um, from an administrative board, um, looked at um, and, and um, confirmed what the privacy commissioner had done, in which they went after a uh, website developer who did something similar. Uh, they provided links to individuals who are active in corporate governance, um, and so this happened to refer to matrimonial records, um, and the court, um, I mean, and the administrative board agreed with the privacy commissioner ordering uh, the website to delink. We are urging um, the website operator to try to appeal this to the courts, um, but again, with the reference to um, the legal uh, fee uh, possibilities, um, is reluctant to do so. So um, it, this appears to be where the action is right now. Okay. Um, quickly going back to Occupy Central. So we had this mass protest um, in the fall of 2014, hundreds of thousands of protesters involving many university, secondary uh, school students um, that resulted after China uh, refused to allow more democratic political reforms. So this sparked uh, this protest on the campuses that spread um, uh, through the, um, the city. And there were um, more than a thousand arrests um, for uh, participation um, uh, in this movement. But interestingly, um, fewer than 200 of these cases have been processed through the judicial system. Uh, so there's a lot pending, but those that have been processed, um, most have pled guilty to fairly minor offenses like uh, unlawful assembly, maybe simple assault, and so on. But the repercussion of that is that there's been a perception of leniency on the part of the Hong Kong government against these youthful protesters. So pro-Beijing legislators, pro-Beijing press, um, um, a liaison office um, has um, seemed to want to take a hardened uh, view on this in light of more recent protests. So over uh, Chinese New Year, a couple of months ago, um, there was a protest um, involving um, when uh, law enforcement tried to remove some illegal food hawkers um, who were there for Chinese New Year. Um, and it, 
those of you who've been to Hong Kong or been to Mong Kok know that this is a very pedestrian friendly, thousands of people gather for various celebrations and um, in a um, riot uh, quickly uh, ensued. Um, there were fires set, there were rocks thrown back and forth, police were firing guns in the air, um, and um, it was uh, quite um, uh, um, a more violent uh, consideration. This time the government um, and prosecution said, okay, forget this, no more you know, just simple assault charges, we're gonna ask for denied bail, um, and uh, we want to um, um, take a more hardline approach. However, the courts, um, um, which have always been kind of on the front line of protecting uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, um, have tried to take a more um, uh, balanced view, have granted a lot of bail. Uh, in one case, it so incensed a former government official who is a deputy of the anti-corruption agency that he posted on Facebook that his followers should try to do a flesh engine approach to this judge to find out whether he had any ties to pro-democracy movement or individuals. Um, that was quickly, um, uh, he was quickly shamed uh, and apologized, I think partly in fear that there might be a scandalizing the court charge pending um, if he uh, continued down this path. Um, okay, um, booksellers. How many people here have heard of the disappearing booksellers in Hong Kong, right? That probably has the biggest seismic effect in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, it, it, its facts are quite simple. We had, uh, since October, of the course of several months, five booksellers who are affiliated with each other um, of the mighty current publishing house and Causeway Books, um, which was a longtime staple in Hong Kong. They sell to a lot of mainland tourists who come over because they have all the juicy banned books from China. A lot of them have to do with the sex lives, you know, whether it's true or false, we don't know. Um, supposedly, they were working on a book about the six former girlfriends of the current president. Um, whatever it was, um, uh, they disappeared. Um, three of them were had family in Shenzhen, so when they were nabbed, they were on mainland territory. Uh, two um, were not. Uh, one, um, uh, I was talking to Duncan about this the other day, um, it was based in Thailand, um, and uh, Gui Minhui um, was also a Swedish national, um, and so he was picked up in Thailand. But probably the thing that bothered most people was um, Li Bo, who um, was uh, disappeared while in Hong Kong. And um, those who are his friends were particularly concerned because he always maintained that he would never go over to the mainland because he knew he was safe in Hong Kong. Um, and that, I think, um, assurances um, no longer the case. They have um, all um, re-emerged. Um, uh, several of them have come back to Hong Kong to say, we're fine, we went there on our own accord, don't worry about us, don't pursue this any further. Li Bo has come back and said, you know, I'm, he posts on Facebook, I'm really happy, please everybody, don't worry about me. But then they quickly turn around and return back uh, to the mainland. Nobody is buying that story. Um, I think the concern on that is the fact that the Hong Kong government has done nothing about that. Um, even though they have recognized early on that this was a violation of the one country, uh, two systems formula, that this is clearly, it was illegal um, if this indeed happened. Um, and so there are some of us who are thinking, is there any possible judicial review that can be done to challenge their lack of action that's still kind of in its infancy stages? So anyone who has any um, ideas or thoughts in this direction will be greatly welcomed. But I think the, the biggest repercussion is, some of you may know um, uh, a dissident by the name of Ching Chong, um, who um, is a wonderful um, journalist and who in 2005 um, was lured over into the mainland and um, was convicted of um, the state secrets, but then that was dropped and then accused of spying for Taiwan when he had published um, some articles for an organization there. He served five years. Um, and then um, uh, came back uh, to Hong Kong and he currently um, uh, stays with us at the Journalism and Media Studies Center. Um, and so I asked him, um, and he's, he'll, he'll say this publicly this much, um, so what do you think? And he says, well, when I came back to Hong Kong, I felt I had two assurances. One, I was protected by the border, 
and two, I was protected by my foreign passport, which he had uh, a British uh, overseas passport, which did um, help him uh, uh, when he was uh, imprisoned. He says, I no longer think that. So, um, so I think that's probably um, its biggest repercussion. And just very, very quickly, I'm sorry, Duncan. I know he's giving me those looks. I won't look this way. Um, there are three quick developments in the last six months, um, and this is something that will be part of my what we're going to look at. In uh, July, the PRC enacted sweeping national security laws uh, that said that the, um, that there's a need to counter emerging threats. Um, and to protect um, the PRC's fundamental interests, including sovereignty, unification, territorial integrity, uh, sustainable development. Um, they included cyberspace, of course, and outer space as part of China's national security interests, along with the ocean and the polar regions. Um, so um, they require key internet and information systems to be secure and controllable. Um, and said that even though this national security law does not technically apply to Hong Kong, Hong Kong has a responsibility for helping to ensure that national security is protected, uh, whatever that means. And then um, in November, criminal law amendments took effect that criminalized the spreading of false rumors on the internet. Um, and then uh, in December, the new anti-terrorism laws that require tech companies to help decrypt information and allow the military to um, uh, venture overseas um, on counter-terror operations. So all of these kind of, you know, put part of the landscape of what we are going to be following and looking at uh, in the year and months to come. Anyway, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Doreen. Yes, in, in academic four, I do normally cut people off, but since this is a freedom of expression conference, <laughs> it's really rather How impossible much did for I go me over? to, I to do that. Um, Doreen very helpfully mentioned Thailand, and that gives me a cue to, yeah. to say a couple of things and abuse my privilege as, as chair here, because the last couple of years I was able to talk about developments in Thailand, and this year I, I don't have time for a full presentation. But let me just tell you that, uh, sadly, the situation has not really improved since uh, I gave my last report last year. So the, the military, as you may recall, seized power on the 22nd of May 2014 and remained very much in power. And the trend in terms of freedom of expression cases across a, a range of different kinds of legislation continues to be extremely negative. So, well, as of the end of September, um, more than 1,600 people have been tried in military courts for various offenses that one way or another subvert the, or supposedly subvert the, the aims of the current military hunter, the National Council for Peace and Order. Um, and we've had an increasing number of Les Majesty cases, more than 30 or so Les Majesty cases in military courts alone, not counting the ones that were already in criminal courts. Uh, increasingly bizarre turns and disturbing turns in those cases. Uh, the most alarming, perhaps, the um, charging of a woman who had I think it was a man actually in this one, who had uh, allegedly defamed the king's dog uh, <laughs> by clicking like on Facebook, uh, on some sort of message relating to uh, criticism of the king's dog. Uh, we've also had people getting jail terms of 58 and 60 years, respectively, for Les Majesty cases, which is a, a huge increase in the length of those jail terms. Very alarming things have, have been going on a, on a wide range of fronts. I talked last time about some of the the bizarre cases, people being prosecuted for eating McDonald's as a form of protest. We've just had a case where a guy was charged with sedition for engaging in a one-man walk protest, which he called the proactive walking citizen. And he, you can be charged for illegally gathering in groups of five or more people, but to be charged for walking down the street as a proactive citizen uh, is a new sort of variation on the sedition theme that I don't think many of us could really get our heads around. So Thailand is unfortunately becoming increasingly alarming and surreal. Um, people have also been charged under the sedition legislation for criticizing General Prayut, the current prime minister, former army commander who staged the coup. And in other areas, we've got a rising use of criminal defamation cases and, of course, the, that old chestnut, the Computer Crime Act, mm. where we saw yes. the, the Prashatai website, Jiranut's sentence was confirmed by the Supreme Court. Luckily, it's a suspended sentence and she's not actually in jail. But uh, some of us were hoping that perhaps the Supreme Court would have thrown out that rather ridiculous uh, charge where she had been 
charged under the Computer Crime Act for failing to remove critical comments with sufficient promptness from the, uh, the comment board of the Prashatai website, which you'll be unsurprised to know no longer has a comments board. Most of the, the websites in Thailand have decided that having comments is just not worth the candle because you just end up getting into too much trouble because you can't take them down in time. So a few disturbing stories from Thailand, and I, I wish I had more time to elaborate on that, but I think we should now proceed um, to the Philippines. Rob. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Dan. Dan. I was going to say that we in the Philippines sometimes feel that um, we're living in a, the absurdities of a Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel um, <laughs> in the last 10 years of uh, litigating and free expression, but I think Thailand takes the cake. Um, we actually represent one uh, Thai blogger uh, in a less majestic case and uh, uh, before the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. And uh, you know, we don't know if there is some causality to, to it, but after we filed a petition with the working group, his case was transferred to the civil courts. Previously, that was with uh, the military court. Um, uh, go, let me now go to the Philippines and um, well, just a, a brief contemporary background to our situation. In 2014, well, the Philippines is a uh, party to the ICCPR, and we're the only one in Southeast Asia that has signed up to the um, optional protocol one. So we, we have the privilege of uh, being able to go through the individual complaints mechanism of the UN Human Rights Committee. Um, in 2014, uh, there's a very important case whose um, effects will continue to reverberate in the next few years, and I think that should, will frame my discussion of the cases. This is a Decini case. We participated in litigating this, but there were 15 petitions filed, uh, which, was, which, which, is, which, are, uh, which were a challenge to the new cybercrime law in the Philippines. And um, there are good sides to this case, and there are also bad sides. I'll begin with the uh, good aspects of this case. Number one, um, it declared the take down or blocking powers of the Justice Department of uh, websites as unconstitutional. It also declared as unconstitutional real-time traffic data collection without a court order. Um, number three, it's, it uh, expanded the actual mal malice test, uh, which we first used in 1970. The Sullivan case was first used in the Philippines in 1970. Uh, in 2014, it added, or maybe it elaborated on what this means. It said that um, gross or even extreme negligence is not sufficient to establish actual malice. So with that expansion, I don't know how you can be convicted of a crime of uh, defamation or libel in the Philippines, but of course, in reality, it's another question because prosecutors are normally lazy. They will just find probable cause and say that uh, it's evidential in nature. So you, go, you still go through the whole uh, trial procedure. Um, number three, oh, we actually challenged the, the new law because it uh, in introduced cyber libel for the first time uh, with heavier penalties. Under offline libel, you can apply for probation. You don't have to go to jail because the maximum um, penalty is uh, six months in prison. But this one, um, minimum of one year. So you can't anymore apply for probation. Um, another aspect of this case is that it declared that there's no intermediary liability in libel. So you can like, you can forward, you can repost a libelous material, but you don't have the kind of liability that the original author, that the author will have under law. Um, so having said that, uh, let me now begin in, uh, with the ca cases, important cases in 2015. There were two uh, cases related to political expression, both relate, relate both in connection with, the, with elections. So, electoral speech. Um, uh, we have uh, the first case that di involving the diocese of the city of Bacolod. At the, around this time, there were, it was elections for the Senate, and the, the diocese of Bacolod posted banners in the premises of the cathedral. It was like team life versus team death. So team life being candidates in favor of pro-life issues, and team death in fa being in favor of um, candidates who would vote for the introduction of, uh, of say, the reproductive ha uh, rights law in the Philippines. Um, this was a classic, actually a classic time, manner, place case because the Commission on Election said we have the right to, um, to regulate the, the posting of these big, big banners. The Supreme Court said, no, that's political speech. Number one, in the first place, it's posted in the premises. 
uh, of a private owner, a pr private property owner, and you cannot regulate uh, what has been posted in um, in the prim private premises. Secondly, it's political speech. It's not commercial speech. And in the scale of values in the Philippine system, um, that um, uh, acquires a high degree of protection. Um, and, uh, th and thirdly, the, the court also said that in the very first place, we're talking here of a group that's not, not political party or running under, running for elections. So it does not come under traditional regulation. Uh, because in the Philippines, um, we have a Fair Elections Act, and there are limitations as to uh, the kind of uh, cov the kind of uh, election election messages that a candidate or a party may may do during an election period. The second case uh, also involves the elections, and this is uh, a case filed by a, a partyless group. Now, in the Philippines, we we have a proportionate rep representation system, so we have regular districts. And then a certain percentage of the congressional seats are allocated to partyless groups. Of uh, two, 300 seats in, in the lower house, around 50 will be allocated to partyless groups. So one partyless group uh, representing, supposedly the idea was you have partyless groups for, for marginal sectors. What happens is that it's, it's become a free for all, so anybody who has money can, can apply for partyless accreditation. And in this case, this is a party list for uh, operators of public utility vehicles. And, and their complaint was that the Commission on Elections was um, infringing the right to post campaign materials on the vehicles and the transport terminals. So the court uh, actually ruled in favor of the party list group uh, because it said this is also political speech and um, there's no substantial distinction that can be made between private owners of private vehicles and those who have franchises. So they said the franchise can be separated from ownership. This is actually an act of ownership. And since uh, even if, uh, even if uh, these vehicles are, are subject to the franchise system, um, th this has no connection to the acts of ownership, which is posting of election materials in, uh, in the, on the vehicles of, uh, of, of those who are members of this party. So, so today, uh, in the Philippines, you can post election materials on public buses, on buses owned by private companies, and these are considered um, protected. A third case uh, involves the freedom of expression of a judge. Um, a judge was teaching in a law school, and uh, there was an investigation of another judge involving marriage camps. Unfortunately, or I think he knew that in his class, the daughter of the judge was um, uh, that she had that he had as a student the daughter of the judge in question, and while the the, the daughter was not there during uh, that session, um, the other students uh, told the daughter who was absent about what this judge said, and he said uh, basically he said that this other judge was involved in one of the biggest married wedding scams in in the Philippines, and that the, another son was appointed uh, to the office even if he was an addict. So naturally, the daughter filed a complaint with the Supreme Court. Um, and the defense of the judge was, this is my free expression. And it can't be curtailed even in the classroom. Well, the court said that um, we have uh, a judicial code of ethics. And uh, we're not supposed to do that uh, because we're, not, we're under our judicial code of ethics. We are to avoid even the slightest um, impression of impropriety. Uh, I think another important um, aspect of the decision is the insistence of the court uh, of the sub judice rule. The court said at the time when uh, he was discussing the case, it was still being investigated by uh, a court committee whether or not uh, the, the judge in question was actually guilty of the allegations. So um, that's a cause of worry for us because um, we regularly represent journalists to report on cases that are being heard, heard by the court. and. Um, well, I think this is the first time in many years that there's such a ruling with the Supreme Court, although involving an administrative case uh, that directly re related to the question of the sub judice rule. A third case, uh, or this is the fourth case, on uh, the right to privacy, uh, which we also litigated. Uh, we have a new rule, one of the new rules drafted by the Supreme Court to protect the rights of citizens. This is called the writ of habeas data. Uh, under this writ, you can um, ask the court uh, if, someone, if somebody has been collecting data about you without your knowledge, you can actually ask the court to issue a writ. 
uh, to uh, disclose and then to destroy whatever was collected. But in this case, the respondent was the commission, the head of the commission on elections because he was making many threats repeatedly in different venues that he was going to place and that he, was, he has placed or is going to place under surveillance members of an election watch group. Uh, we have problems with the automation of elections in the Philippines involving Smartmatic. And for the last uh, six years, you know, this group has, who were also our clients, had been raising alarm uh, after alarm about the way in which our, our elections ha had been automated by the Commission on Elections involving this group. And uh, the commission, the top commissioner of the Commission on Elections has been issuing threats that the, our clients are under surveillance or will be placed on, under surveillance because they are uh, election saboteurs. So we filed this petition with the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court um, accepted the case and the procedure is that it's remanded before the Court of Appeals. Uh, it's the Court of Appeals that does the reception of evidence. So in due time you finish with the presentation and the ruling was uh, a bit of a disappointment because the court said the, uh, in February of this year that there was no evidence that actual physical harm or, or actual surveillance uh, was proven uh, in, the, in, in, the, um, in the trial. But the thing is that uh, when I cross-examined the, the commissioner, she admitted to making all of these statements that, that uh, were extensively reported in, uh, in the newspapers, that he admitted that uh, he made the threats, he admitted that he had placed them under surveillance. He admitted that uh, he, he, he called the, our clients uh, electoral sab saboteurs. And under a ruse, when you make such admissions, there's no need for uh, further introduction of, um, of evidence, uh, which unfortunately the Court of Appeals um, uh, just ignored those judicial admissions made by the, by the main respondent uh, during cross-examination. So um, we've taken that to the Supreme Court uh, in March. Uh, and uh, another an important issue I think here is that it's not just really the actual surveillance because under the rules on it of habeas data, a threat to the security of a person that involves life, liberty, and security uh, is, a, is a ground for a resort to the rid of habeas data. Now, um, going to in cases that we expect uh, would have some development this year, uh, this is a case, uh, uh, I think Peter, was, or, Peter was, or, was here when this happened. This was uh, at the, a Navy officer. This was during the last administration, which was quite um, uh, unpopular because of human rights violations and a lot of uh, political issues raised against it. So there was a group of young Naval officers who staged a, an attempted coup, and they were all arrested. Now, there was an ongoing trial for, a, for rebellion, and uh, the leader of the, Navy, of the Navy officers during one trial, and Peter was there, he was observing the trial, walked out of trial, and then went to, the, to a nearby hotel, one of the uh, five-star hotels in, in the business district, and started calling on the people to, um, to rebel against the president. So the long and short of it is that, of course, it it invited media um, coverage, and there were many journalists who hold up with, him, with this group in, in the hotel. Um, the government sent a tank. The tank, it was really quite dramatic because the, 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 the tank just uh, rammed the, the doors of the hotel, went inside, and there was a lot of tear gas and all that, and the journalists there were arrested. And, uh, and all the officers of the Philippine National Police, the armed forces, the, the Secretary of Justice, they all, said that it was legal and that they also issued warnings that any similar uh, actions will be dealt with severely, uh, meaning that uh, if the journalists in question would, uh, uh, would refuse to heed the orders to leave the police line, to step out of the police, then they'll be arrested. So this is the very first time where uh, the question of whether crossing the police line could get you arrested if you refuse to heed a lawful order of the police, because we have in the Revised Penal Code a provision there that says uh, a violation of a lawful order uh, could, could, be, could be prosecuted. So these journalists were, were arrested. They were held to the police camp. They were, told, they were not told 
uh, on which grounds they were being arrested, and they were released hours later. So we filed a, a case uh, against the against the government, including the Secretary of Justice, the Chief of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, the Chief of the Philippine National Police. This was dismissed by the Court of Appeals, but it's been pending with uh, the Supreme Court for the last three years. And um, since all of uh, the pleadings have been um, filed, though, we expect uh, that uh, the court will have something to say on this case uh, this year. Um, in May, this May, we have a case uh, involving a student, a student journalist who wrote a parody involving the, the journalism professor in the same university. And the irony of irony is the journalism professor filed a defamation suit against the student. Um, now, this professor's family used to own one of the biggest uh, newspapers in the Philippines, one of the top business paper, and uh, and uh, and uh, there was a trial, and in May there, there will be a decision by the court. So uh, the issue here is whether or not parody is constitutionally protected. So I will wrap up uh, for the last 30 seconds. Um, as a result of uh, the this real ruling in Dicini, what we're seeing is that there. Are more cases filed using the cybercrime law. And uh, the defenses that are left with us is the public figure defense and the actual malice test. So what's happening is that corporations, like mining firms, banks, uh, these are actual cases we're handling, are filing suits against um, human rights defenders or environmentalists and newspapers saying that um, their, their good name, their goodwill as corporations are being uh, besmirched by by all by this, the claims of our newspapers about their operations. So we have two or three cases now pending in before the office of the prosecutor or before the trial court or the court of appeals that involve this question of uh, the the right of corporations to claim damages and to to file even a, a criminal suit. Um, and on that note, I will end the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Least we'll get to Korea. From Latin America. Yes. Because they have the Okay, yeah. I'll enjoy the privilege of going last, which means I'm not, I don't have to fill up too much time, because I don't have much time to fill. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, there so I'll start with a, a little bit of numbers um, on defamation and online takedowns. Uh, Korea is a country of uh, 50 million people. There are 2,000 criminal defamation indictments a year. About 50 people are incarcerated uh, every year. Uh, so back in 2005, Article 19 did the numbers on how many people are incarcerated for defamation around the whole world. And I noticed that the number did not include Korea. Uh, so in that 28-month period, uh, about 200 people were incarcerated around the whole world except Korea, where about 50 people were incarcerated, uh, which accounted for like 28% of all people incarcerated. And some of them are incarcerated for uh, truth defamation. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. On top of that, we have 9,000 insert indictments a year. Wow. Uh, and uh, I mean, the Korea, Korea is a relatively safe country, so uh, the total number of indictments for any crime is only 200,000. And about 10,000 of that is for insert or defamation. And then internet takedowns. And I'm not going to talk about copyright. Uh, that I'm talking about takedowns for defamation, privacy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Government-initiated takedowns are 200, okay, I'm missing K there, right? <laughs> 200,000 URLs or sites wow. each year uh, under this standard of what is necessary for sound communication ethics. I don't know whether that standard is more vague than annoying as in the case of uh, India. Um, and then privately initiated takedowns is also 500,000. Again, you need K there. URLs or sites each year. Uh, under the law, intermediaries must take down, at least temporarily, whenever someone cries defamation or privacy infringement. Uh, so now you have the background. 
major cases. There were three big defamation cases, all uh, decided at the first level. So uh, uh, they are not uh, cast in stone. So we'll have to watch out for what happens to those cases on appeal. Uh, the first one, uh, well, all three of them involve, uh, uh, are related to sinking ships. Uh, the Sour Ferry Disaster, uh, you all know about Sour Ferry Disaster. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, so a Korea correspondent, uh, Korea correspondent of a Japanese newspaper, Sankei Shimon, was indicted for defaming the president of South, South Korea uh, when he wrote that uh, Korean people have questions about the president's whereabouts well about during the seven hours following the Seoul Ferry disaster. And people also have questions about the president's uh, amorous relationship with a certain individual. Uh, and these questions were raised by other newspapers as well. But what put apart Sankei Shimun was that it dared to relay a rumor that put the two questions in the same sentence, to wit, the president was with his putative boyfriend for the now proverbial missing seven hours. Earlier in, the, earlier in the trial, the defendant and the prosecutors quickly agreed that any statement that put the president with uh, uh, that individual for seven hours was false. The court of first instance ruled that Sankey did not have, quote, an intent to defame, unquote, the president, but only meant to report on the quantity and substance of uh, the unresolved questions that people have over the president. Sankei was found not guilty. The significance of this case is that uh, uh, there is no neutral reportage defense explicitly recognized in Korea, but I think uh, uh, this case kind of uh, 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 created that defense uh, through the element of, uh, uh, quote, intent to defame. The second case uh, involves uh, a, uh, a volunteer rescuer. Uh, okay, so the order is reversed. The second case involves a volunteer rescuer uh, who uh, stated that the Coast Guards were blocking the volunteer divers from going in, and she was arrested and indicted for defaming the Coast Guard officials. Uh, the case received intense media coverage because she was previously vilified by the media as a case of uh, self-aggrandizing uh, self beauty and also because the implication of her statement with respect to the infamously, infamously fumbling rescue efforts which attracted the angry models, angry models from people like, quote, capital caused the sinking, the state caused the massacre, unquote. Uh, she was uh, in jail for more than 100 days. The court decided that she did not have intent to defame the Coast Guards, but she only intended to pressure the Coast Guards into expediting its own rescue efforts and allowing volunteer divers to participate in the rescue. Um, the court also, uh, the court did find uh, her the court did find her incidental allegation that some, uh, uh, her incidental allegations about uh, survivors, uh, survivors being able to talk through the steel wall to the rescue divers, but the court held that uh, she cannot be deemed intentional with respect to falsity of the statement because uh, she was basing uh, her statement on the rumors that she heard at the rescue site. The prosecution appealed and the case is pending. Um, now, jurisprudentially, I think the case reaffirms uh, the New York Times versus Sullivan rule uh, that when it comes to the statements about public officials, even clearly false statements can be exempt from liability if the speaker was not intentional with respect to the falsity of the statement. The third case uh, concerns Republic of Korea ship Corvette Chonan. Uh, a ship that was uh, uh, a ship that sank uh, five years ago uh, for no uh, for no uh, uh, specify uh, for no clear reason yet not clear yet yet uh, the court of first instance acquitted a uh, dissident a, a dissident member of the joint commission on the sinking of uh, Corvette. 
uh, he raised questions about the commission's final findings. He proposed that the so-called bubble jet technology that the Joint Commission claims to have been used by the North Korean submarine is a very improbable given the remnants of the accident. He proposed an alternative theory of a collision with an Israeli-made submarine as a more probable theory. Uh, the case took five years and numerous trials and witnesses. The court basically agreed that there was room for reasonable doubt with uh, uh, within the Joint Commission's findings and that he had, he had the right to raise those doubts without actually proving them. Again, this was a straight application of the New York Times versus Sullivan, which put the onus of proving falsity on the complaining party, in this case, uh, in, in this case the Navy officials, uh, who could not sew up all the holes in the bubble jet theory. So. Uh, Quickly, you can see a trend where these uh, uh, prosecutions for what I call seditious libel, basically libel prosecutions designed to gag the citizenry from criticizing government policies and performance are on the rise in Korea. And to that end, as you saw in the numbers, the crime of insult, criminal defamation, truth defamation laws are uh, being used. Uh, let's see. Now, on and then there were three big constitutional cases. Uh, one was uh, dissolution of uh, United Progressive Party. Uh, the constitutional court dissolved a progressive political party for two reasons. Number one, that its platform, though the text supports only, although the text, the text of the platform only supports a legitimate progressive causes, uh, according to the court, it hides an objective it hides an objective of establishing North Korean style socialism in, in South Korea, and therefore does not comply with the democratic principles, and also that the party held meetings where some participants attempted to incite subversion, violent subversion against the state. state. Um, in analysis, uh, it, its reasoning is in some way much like the US Supreme Court case Abrams, where the teachings of Marxist and Leninism themselves were punished in absence of any clear and present danger. Uh, this 1950 Supreme Court case. Uh, this case is uh, in one way even worse than Abrams because uh, none of the party's officials, uh, none of the party's official literature or the officials themselves speaks of a uh, Marxist Leninist ideology or any equivalent of it. The constitutional court read into, read into the party officials intent simply on the basis of some remarks made by non-official participants in party meetings. The second constitutional case concerns uh, truth defamation. Uh, together with the uh, uh, Sewer Ferry Volunteer Rescue case, uh, this one was uh, conducted, conducted uh, by uh, our team. A senior, citizen, a senior citizen complained aloud online about a senior citizen association's officials who violently disrupted a private gathering of its members so violently that one of the officer's companions was found guilty of battery. The author of the posting was found guilty of cyber defamation when his posting, though true, was considered not solely for the public interest. In the ensuing constitutional challenge, the constitutional court reasoned that the speed and reach of information diffusion allows punishing truth while two justices dissented. Uh, Given that the court focused on the dangerousness of the medium, the internet, uh, I think it left room for another challenge as to offline truth defamation. Uh, the third uh, constitutional case uh, concerns virtual child pornography. Um, Korea, Korea's child pornography provision punishes animations and cartoons uh, it punishes animes, animations and cartoons showing child characters under the same provision that features or refers to real children equally as child sex offenders, uh, putting the defendants under 20 years location restoration and 10 years employment restriction. The constitutional court upheld a virtual child pornography provision constitutional to the extent that its interpretation is limited to the material which can cause extraordinary sexual desires and therefore cause the viewers to commit sexual offenses against children. This case was important because it put to the test 
a question whether imagination of an event can be punished the same as the event that actually took place, as in the movie Minority Report. Fortunately, the Constitutional Court did not depart from the tenet that speech cannot be punished unless it has clear present danger of creating physical harm. Although the law was found constitutional, the Constitutional Court read down the provision. As a result, the number of investigations decreased from two to 3,000 a year to four to 500. Uh, the seventh one, I don't think I have time to talk about it, but uh, I do want to talk about what we should do. Uh, I talked about the trends. The danger of the internet, uh, the more and more we are seeing court cases that are discriminating against the internet as a medium. Uh, what is uh, lawful offline is being considered unlawful online. We need to fight back on this. Uh, so there are some, uh, uh, you know, there are some interest, in, interesting stories to tell about it, but I don't think I have time. Uh, these are the cases, uh, the previous Supreme Court, uh, previous constitutional court cases in Korea that uh, protected or that um, praised the internet as the uh, great equalizer um, and the need to protect uh, uh, online uh, freedom of speech. And I think we should do more work on that uh, in uh, educating people about the value of the internet as the medium. Uh, and uh, also, I propose that we need to do, we need, uh, we do more work on truth defamation. For the countries where you have uh, truth defamation provisions in the books, but uh, not practiced, I think you have to remove them because uh, other countries that use truth defamation, that actively use truth defamation, look at the, look at the law books of the countries that have them and uh, justify their practice. And for the countries that uh, use uh, uh, truth defamation actively, uh, I think uh, we need a campaign of uh, uh, constitutional challenges against that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Well, we've had some very authoritative presentations, and they've taken quite a bit of time. Uh, so we have time, I hope, for at least a couple of questions. Uh, Anybody would like to ask something, please? Yes. I had a quick question about uh, uh, the uh, ISP liability in India. Um, as I'm, I'm looking at, uh, as you know, Section 230 in the U.S. is very broadly read. Um, and uh, it's been expanded to the, the web blogger or web, the, the creator of the web page itself for content that's contributed to it. I'm thinking uh, specifically about this uh, expose page of uh, sexual harassment that you, that you mentioned. Um, section, is it 77 of the Information Act, has a carve out that I thought maybe you could talk about a little bit where it says that um, section seven, which information, uh, section 77? Uh, uh, 79, I'm sorry, of the Information Act. Yeah. yeah. The, our information. Yeah, technology. yeah. Has this carve out that says, yes, ISPs are immune, but not so if there is collusion between the originator of the content and the, the ISP itself. Yeah. Uh, has that been fleshed out? Are there any cases? Because one could arguably say merely asking for comments is it has a hand in the cookie jar. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and has, has the ISP liability, or ISP exemption rather, been expanded to, has it right now just been the real, just the servers, you know, the, the, the pure tech side, or has it been expanded to the, the, the creators of the web page who are posting third party content? Further questions? I have a question um, regarding the Philippines. You were um, you were stating a case or, or a case based on a law on privacy, um, and I didn't get the name. Have it, yeah. Yeah, 
Uh, this is actually borrowed from uh, Latin America, the rate of habeas data. Uh, we have uh, two ways of uh, protecting privacy now. We have a new Data Privacy Act, which is administrative in nature. There's a, data, there's a commission on data privacy. Yeah. And then every corporation now is uh, required to have a data privacy officer. It's just been uh, being implemented. And then the rate of habeas data is broader. It's a court procedure. You file a, 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 a case in court. Uh, yeah. And it's very broad in its uh, coverage of uh, the data privacy protection. Okay, my question is um, the right to sue someone or to the right to go to court and get a court order to get information or data deleted. Is yes. that a, a court order towards uh, public authorities or is it a court order against private persons or can it be both? What's uh, so good about this law is that it's for both private and public. So a corporation can be a subject of uh, the, a petition, but it's personal. It's, it has to be the person suffering from uh, the, the pervasion of privacy who can go to court. Thanks very much indeed. I think we're over time, so we'll have to bring this session to a halt. We can continue the conversations informally. But thank you very much to all the speakers for their great talks. Thank you, thank you very much for steering the discussion.